Yeah, <clears throat> Court Johnson. Um, could you explain uh, the how a virus cannot be infectious with regard to PML, PMLVs and yet be infect so many different animals? Uh, I mean, what, what constitutes an infectious virus in no, the, These probably started off as infectious virus, but eventually were integrated into the chromosome and lost parts. That they're, they're retained as uh, what you might call retroviral fossils but no longer retain the capacity to replicate. You can still detect these fossils. And we know that they, at, one, at one stage they were retroviruses. They're no longer retroviruses because over time they've lost parts of their genome that were important for replication. So we could have PMLV fossils? Humans could be... Could I'm have... not prepared to, to answer that question at the moment. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I think we need a little bit more work before I can answer that question. We have the all so that's percent it. of the genomes endogenous retrovirus. Well, there's, John Coffin has always said there's there's more of them in us than us. There's more endogenous retroviruses in, in the genome than, than than real you might say real DNA. Um, but I, I again I think we need to just at the moment stick with the the, the, the discovery. Of, nor, of MLV like sequences in the low et, the low et al paper. Uh, can XMRV, XMRV cause substantial problems in humans without replicating? Or without replicating hardly at all? Just by being there, could it cause substantial problems? If it integrated into a site, the site of integration would be very important. That could potentially lead to oncogenesis. Other than oncogenesis, can it affect immune functioning simply by integrating in the wrong part of a, of a genome? I don't see why not. I mean, it depends on what pathway it's about to, to knock up. Every time it integrates, <laughs> it destroys some gene function. Uh, oh, instead, an, an, something that's not integrating, causing the disease, as you're saying. How could that happen? No, I think you'd need to have integrated virus, wouldn't you? Oh, oh, I see. But what about latency versus active replication? Because if you had a latently, if you had a virus inserted in the wrong spot uh, and sitting there latently, one could imagine that that, that could cause some, some problem. Um, but if it and not be replicated. One of the things that my, my good friend here on the left often speaks about is that pieces of virus can be as damaging as virus, or pieces of virus could actually cause a great deal of, of downstream problems. So you might just be making little bits and pieces of Epstein-Barr virus, like, like DUPTase, for instance, and then have that affect a, a lot of other functions in the immune system and in the endocrine system and so on. So I don't see why you couldn't also speculate that uh, HIV bits could be doing doing us mischief. What do you think? That you, I yeah. Just spoke oh, yeah. I think it's just <laughs> a very different way of looking at viruses. Um, you know, I've been brought up as a virologist. A virus infects a cell, kills a cell, causes pathology, and off you go. But it's more than that. But if I, you know, we, we just recently got a very nice grant from our colleagues at the NIH. He keeps saying thank you. <laughs> He's really grateful. That's going, to allow us, that's going to allow us to expand significantly this line of research. So far, we've only been looking at one protein and what it does in certain circumstances. What this is going to do is it's going to allow us to, to, to get the same, end, the same protein, but from four other herpes viruses as well and try them in combination with each other because this isn't, I can't believe only one, you know, there's only going to be one protein that's going to work. It's got to be probably a complex of interactions going on. So that will give us a clue as to, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you, know, where that, you know, where that concept is going. The other thing is, I didn't mention this, but this, this grant that we have is, is really a stress and EBV grant. It's just going to allow us, because by looking at the same proteins that we're looking at for chronic fatigue syndrome, to allow us to slip sideways, sort of, and take a look at that. But we have data that shows that the D, if, 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 you take, if you take primary 
PVLs, blood cells, and infect those cells with EBV to transform them, to growth transform those cells. It, it'll be B cells that are gonna growth transform. If you add the DUTPase to those cultures during the early phase of virus cell interaction, just the protein significantly enhances the production of transformed cells. That means that there could be risk, and I asked, I called Nancy about this because I wasn't sure. Is, is there a risk for B cell, or for lymphoma, B cell lymphoma, in chronic fatigue syndrome patients? Because we have found a way to explain that if there is, how that could happen.